My name is Richard Brabander, and I'm a member of the Canada Industrial Relations Board. I've been asked to chair this panel. Uh, it's my privilege to be involved in such a remarkable conference. Uh, it's, I, I don't need to remind anyone, last night's speech by David Weil was really, really fascinating and really set the stage. Uh, there were some particularly uh, vibrant remarks, I must say, by Craig Flood as well, who's been very much involved in this and organizing it with Professor Michael Link. And this morning's keynote address by Brian Burkett really did set the stage. What followed with the first panel that we've just heard, I mean, really has put in front of us a, a, a banquet uh, on which to build, from which to draw, and has really opened up some different themes and ideas on how to deal with the issue before us. We have three people who are very highly qualified, uh, leaders, scholars. Uh, I think the three are well known to you all, but I don't think it's out of place for me to read a little about each one when I introduce them. Um, the first speaker will be Professor Leo Fosco, a fellow of the Royal Society, a professor of political science and tier one Canada research chair in political economy of gender and work at York University. And her current research focuses on employment standards enforcement in Ontario and the federal jurisdiction and on access to labor rights and protections among temporary migrant workers. Uh, she has published, of course, uh, books and journal articles widely. Uh, some of her recent scholarship has also appeared in uh, Economic and Industrial Democracy, Industrial Relations Journal, Industrial Law Journal, Journal of Ethnic and Migration Studies, and Journal of Industrial Relations. Uh, in 2016-17, she served on an academic reference group advising the special advisors to Ontario's Changing Workplace Review of the province's Labor Relations and Employment Standards Acts, and prepared two independent studies for the review on the subjects of exemptions from and enforcement of the Employment Standards Act. Uh, and she will speak to us on her analysis of some particular characteristics of specific occupational groups that are treated differently from most other workers under the Employment Standards Act. I'll also introduce right away Professor Kevin Banks, who I think will be our second speaker. He's an associate professor of law at Queen's University and director of the Queen's Center for Law in the Contemporary Workplace. He has an SJD from Harvard, an LLB, and BA in Economics from University of Toronto. <laughs> He has significant publications on workplace human rights law, international labor law, collective bargaining law, and the contract of employment. And he has served in a number of senior positions within the public service of Canada, including Director General, Labor Policy and Workplace Information, Director of Research with the Federal Labor Standards Review Commission, and Director of the Inter-American Labor Cooperation. He's currently the editor-in-chief of the Canadian Labor and Employment Law Journal and serves as a labor arbitrator and recently chaired an international arbitral panel hearing a dispute concerning the labor provisions of the U.S. Central America Free Trade Agreement, the first such case decided anywhere in the world. And our third speaker will be, I think you know him well, but allow me regardless to read a little of what he wrote. He instructed me and he said I could and I should shrink it further. Uh, it's pretty hard to shrink uh, what Harry has done for us in our labor community in Canada. Uh, many people refer to him as our preeminent scholar in labor law. Uh, he's a university professor emeritus, former dean of Osgoode Hall Law School, former president of York University, has published extensively in legal education and the legal profession, legal history and legal theory, labor and administrative law, globalization, and constitutionalism. And in addition to serving as an arbitrator and mediator in labor disputes, Professor Arthurs has conducted inquiries and reviews at Canadian, British, and American universities, has provided advice to governments on issues ranging from higher education policy to the Constitution to labor and employment law, and most recently chaired the review, which was mentioned earlier, of the labor standards legislation, uh, federally and in Ontario, workplace safety insurance system as well. His contributions have been recognized by his election as an associate of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, and a corresponding fellow of the British Academy, 
and he has been honored by numerous Canadian universities and professional bodies, the governments of Canada and Ontario, the Canada Council, the International Labour Organization, and the Labour Law Research Network. And he will address us on the increasing importance and prospects for further development and potential reach of statutory labor standards, especially where collective bargaining does not reach as well. So we have a tremendously capable and competent and experienced panel, and I think we should hear without delay from the first speaker, mm -hmm. Professor Great. Bosco. There we go. All right, thank you. Well, thanks very much uh, to Michael and all of the organizers uh, for organizing this wonderful event and for inviting me to participate. The Ontario Employment Standards Act sets uh, minimum terms and conditions in areas such as pay, working conditions, working time, holidays and leaves and termination and severance of employment, as you've heard. And of course, it represents a key source of workplace protection for employees in the province and it is therefore the focus of my talk today. In recognition of the need to address precarious employment in the province's labor force, recently the Ontario government introduced the Fair Workplaces Better Jobs Act, which makes improvements to key provisions of the ESA, uh, including by increasing the minimum wage to $15 by 2019, augmenting vacation entitlements and addressing unfair scheduling. Simultaneously, the Government of Ontario has, in, has initiated a review of the many exemptions and special rules which limit the application of employment standards provisions. And in my talk today, stemming from some work I've been doing as a principal investigator of a multi-year study of employment standards and their enforcement, I'll address the issue of exemptions and, and special rules. Early in our study, it became clear that despite the enormity of exemptions and their effects, and the challenges that they pose to enforcement, they remain a poorly understood and documented dimension of the ESA. Consequently, the issue of exemptions has become a central focus. And on the basis of this ongoing research, I want to contend that exemptions and special rules can exacerbate precariousness among those who require the protection of the ESA the most. Specifically, they can have acute consequences for employees in occupations comprised of significant shares of social groups otherwise disadvantaged in the labor market, such as young people, recent immigrants, and women. And to make this argument, I'm going to consider the cases of three occupational groups that share in common an exemption or special rule pertaining to the fundamental standard of the minimum hourly wage, home care employees, liquor servers, and agricultural employees. But before proceeding by way of a bit of a framing, I want to offer a few preliminaries about exemptions and special rules and their origins and a very brief, hopefully, profile of precarious employment building on what's been said in the first panel. So in Ontario, employment uh, standards have always been marked by a tension between establishing social minima to protect employees vulnerable to exploitation and limiting the impact of legislated employment standards on business profitability, and exemptions and special rules have been key to the negotiation of this tension. Under the 1920 Minimum Wage Act, for example, a provincial board was established to set minimum wages for female employees, yet the Act exempted farm laborers and domestic servants and permitted lower minimum wages to be ordered for inexperienced and young female employees. In the mid-1960s, as Ontario combined it, the existing patchwork of standards to develop the ESA, legislators aspired to achieve a minimum floor of rights for the largest number of uh, employees possible. Still, like its precursors, the ESA was shaped by the assumption that its minimum standards must be economically practicable and aim, and here I'm quoting the Arctum archival research, keep industry and to attract new industries to the province. 
the tension in the overall aims of the employment standards of employment standards legislation persists and has arguably deepened as exemptions and special rules have multiplied over the years. This tension motivates my metaphor of the tattered quilt based on data from 2016 excluding severance pay provisions only about 39% or about 2 million employees in Ontario are fully covered by the ESA. That is approximately 61% are subject to at least one exemption or special rule. The limited and uneven coverage of the ESA is especially problematic in light of the spread of precarious employment and its disproportionate impact on social and occupational groups disadvantaged in the labor market. Now because definitions are so important, uh, I will say that I define precarious employment to entail work for remuneration characterized by dimensions of labor market insecurity, such as lack of control over the labor process, low income, and you see my measures here, uncertainty surrounding continuing employment, and limited access to regulatory protection. As this slide shows, in 2016, the share of Ontario's labour force lacking coverage by a collective agreement was 73%, as we've heard, a figure rising to 86% considering the private sector alone. The share of, uh, of employees in Ontario's labour force earning low wages, also growing, as we heard from Sheila Block, reaching 31% overall in 2016 and 40% in the private sector. That year, the proportion of employees who had worked for an employer for less than a year was also 19%, and a sizable share of employees, um, as emphasized by Raphael, are engaged in small uh, firms. Now, I also understand precarious employment to be shaped by social location and by social context, that is, industry, occupation, geography, and such. And the prevalence of precarious employment uh, of is, is shaped by these uh, sex, age, and immigration status as well. In Ontario, young people aged 15 to 24 are far more likely than their older counterparts to hold jobs devoid of coverage by collective agreement, earn low wages, work in small firms, and have short job tenure. Gender also shapes precarious employment. We know, for example, women are much more likely than men to earn low wages. And of course, recent immigrants who immigrated fewer than five years ago are more likely than the Canadian-born or settled immigrants not to be covered by a collective agreement and to hold low wages and to work in small firms and to have short job tenure. Now there's also variation in the prevalence of precarious employment by industry. Using a kind of composite indicator that treats a job as precarious in the presence of three or more of the foregoing indicators, we see that in Ontario, employees in accommodations and food services, and in agriculture, hold precarious jobs. Uh, this, pro this profile of precarious employment then, uh, summarizing in a way but, but drilling down a little bit uh, the, what's been said in the previous panel, puts into relief the need for a robust floor of employment standards. The share of precarious employment in Ontario is increasing, and its prevalence among social groups otherwise disadvantaged in the labor force, as well as certain industries, is arguably a cause for concern. So since many of the uh, ESA's exemptions and special rules apply on the basis of occupation, what I want to do now is consider three occupational groups that share in common an exemption or special rule pertaining to the fundamental standard of the hourly minimum wage. Home care employees, liquor servers, and agricultural employees. And I want to use these examples to illustrate how exemptions and special rules can exacerbate precarious employment among employees in occupations comprised of significant shares of social groups that are otherwise disadvantaged in the labor force. Approximately 25,000 home care employees provide homemaking and personal support services in private homes in Ontario. Despite their often long hours of work, home care employees are only entitled to the minimum wage for a maximum of 12 hours per day. They are in addition exempt from the ESA's working time standards, and if they are engaged by a community care access center or an entity under contract with one, an increasing reality with fissuring 
home care employees are exempt from the ESA's temporary agency, help agency rules. Now, as archival records from the Ontario Women's Bureau show, the original justification for these exemptions were quite unprincipled, and they included the difficulty of enforcement, here I'm quoting archival records, the assumption that the work may involve so-called personal tasks in addition to so-called work tasks, and the lack of recognition of tasks of domestic employees as real work. Given the composition of home care employees as an occupational groups, group, the effects of exemptions applicable to it fall disproportionately on social groups otherwise disadvantaged in the labor market. So over 90% of home care employees are women, and studies also show when compared to employ, empl Ontario employees as a whole, a relatively large share of home care employees are racialized. Exemptions and special rules applicable to home care workers also exist alongside their high degree of precariousness along a number of dimensions. Approximately 60% lack coverage under a collective agreement, and even unionized home care employees lack control over the labor process in key respects, as their collective bargaining power is constrained by the prevalence of subcontracting in home care services in Ontario, coupled with the lack of successor rights in instances of re uh, contract retendering. 53% of home care workers report wages lower than two-thirds of the median hourly rate for full-time employees. And in some then, exemptions and special rules applicable to home care workers coincide with precariousness along these dimensions and among an occupational group comprised of large shares of women, uh, many of whom are racialized. Shifting to my second illustration, of liquor servers. Liquor servers are defined um, as employees who as regular part of their employment serve liquor directly to customers, guests or members in a place for which a liquor license or permit is issued. There were roughly 51,000 in Ontario's labour force in 2016. Liquor servers are subject to a lower minimum wage than the general public as they are presumed to supplement their earnings via tips. As with the case of home care employees, the costs associated with lower minimum wage floor applied to liquor servers disproportionately affects groups already disadvantaged in the labor force. Nearly three quarters of liquor servers are women, and young people are overrepresented in this occupational group. Fully 43% of liquor servers are between 19 and 24 years of age, and a majority of them are not students. The lower minimum wage for liquor servers also exists alongside the precariousness of the occupational group more broadly. Almost all liquor servers are non-unionized, so much so that I couldn't even extract the data from the research data center. Uh, furthermore, nearly three-quarters or 73% of liquor servers are low-waged, a prevalence of low-wage work more than twice that found uh, among Ontario employees as a whole. And while the lower minimum wage is often justified on the assumption that tips will supplement liquor servers' earnings, as the Changing Workplace uh, Review reported, 20% report earnings lower than the general minimum wage even after reported tips and commissions. Indicative of the magnitude of uncertainty confronting li liquor servers as well, almost 40% also report working at their current job for less than a year, two times the average of all employees. So in sum, the lower minimum wage for liquor servers contributes to the precariousness confronting this occupation and disproportionately affects women and young people. Shifting to my final case, the case of agricultural workers, two groups are subject to significant exemptions or special rules, including those pertaining to the minimum wage. Farm employees and harvesters. Farm employees are exempt from minimum wage, all working time standards, as well as public holiday and vacation uh, with pay standards. Harvesters, paid by the peace, must receive peace rates high enough that an employee using reasonable effort could earn at least the general minimum wage. Like farm employees, they're also exempt from all working time standards, as well as subject to special rules for vacation and public holidays. Archival records reveal the primacy of minimizing labor costs 
among the rationales for such exemptions. And, and they also show the that the validity of these rationales has been, has been emphasized by the um, by Ministry of Labor officials over the decades. The array of exemptions facing farm employees and harvesters affect a highly disadvantaged group, temporary migrant workers who comprise a large portion of agricultural workers in Ontario and experience extreme disadvantage in the labor force. Considering entries for just one temporary migrant work program, Ontario issued over 24,000 positive labor market impact assessments associated with the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program in 2015. Now, agricultural workers also confront numerous dimensions of precariousness. They're excluded from the Labor uh, Relations Act, and 71% uh, are precariously employed, a figure shaped by their exclusion from collective bargaining, and particularly high rates of low wages and employment in small firms prevail. In sum, the cases of home care employees, liquor servers, and agricultural workers highlight the ways in which exemptions and special rules can exacerbate precarious employment among occupational groups comprised of large numbers of employees that are otherwise disadvantaged. And in this, in this light, there is a need to be attentive to the potential of compounding such disadvantage in any review of exemptions and special rules such as the one that is ongoing. So the current review of exemptions and special rules following the Changing Workplaces Review is, is certainly a welcome uh, development. However, it's essential to foster equitable representation of employees and employers in the review process. Otherwise, there is a significant risk that those with greater resources will be better equipped to participate in consultations, resulting in an equ inequitable deliberative process and potentially inequitable outcomes. In other words, history has a funny way of repeating itself. We must also recognize that in, the context, in a context where many Ontario workers are slated to benefit from the rising floor of workplace standards, persistent exemptions could contribute to deepening segmentation in the labor market, further marginalizing those in occupations that are already characterized by acute precariousness. And that concludes what I have to say. Thank you. to the time. Excellent. Thanks. Oh, you mm -hmm. need this. Good? Okay. Well, I, I, I would also like to thank the organizers for the invitation to participate in this conference. Uh, it's been uh, really fascinating to see the combination of legal analysis and empirical scholarship uh, that enables us to focus in a sustained way on this important set of issues. Um, my talk this morning uh, will deal with the implications of fishering for employment standards in Ontario with a particular focus on the enforcement of employment standards uh, in light of a research report that I did for the Changing Workplaces Review and also to some extent uh, reflecting on my role as, as an academic advisor to that review and participating in conversations with Leah and others in, in that process. Um, so my, my starting points are uh, pretty much derived from uh, David Weil's work. Uh, I, I take a definition of fissuring that uh, considers it as organizational forms that enable effective control over methods and output uh, in production networks um, while strongly influencing but not directly determining and therefore enabling entities with control over production to distance themselves from the, the determination of uh, terms and conditions of employment. 
Um, there are, of course, a number of forms that fishering takes. Uh, David has uh, amply discussed those, and I need not linger on this. Uh, it's important to remind ourselves of the drivers or causes of the fishering phenomenon. Um, and as, as David explained yesterday, it's an interaction of effective demand by capital markets for increased profitability, a focus on core competency, but also opportunities, incentives, and incentives to shed employment-related costs. And, and this means, I think, that you know, uh, because some of the underlying costs, causes of fishing lie there, some of the levers to address it also lie within the, the range of labor and employment law and employment standards law in particular. Uh, similarly, the enabling conditions, while some of them are due to uh, information technologies, which we don't directly control through employment standards law, uh, some of them are due to the development of legal technologies, uh, the perfection of franchising arrangements, um, contracting arrangements that enable the kinds of monitoring that were described, um, and employment contracts that, that um, are disguised as independent contracts uh, and serve to enable a good deal of misclassification. So the consequences, um, pressures on wages and working conditions, I'm not going to linger on those. Um, I'm going to focus on the erosion of legal accountability, uh, and in particular on the increased evasion of legal responsibility and the assignment of legal responsibility to entities that have a greater propensity either to violate the law or to be unable to provide redress. Um, briefly, with, res uh, with respect to inequality, this, uh, I, this is a slide that I often use um, I'm teaching my students gives us the long view. Starting in 1914, we see uh, how uh, median wages in real terms rose steadily. And I think if you mapped a productivity curve onto that, you'd see a, a, a good solid tracking of that up until about 1977, where things flatten out. Um, this suggests that the inequality problem predates to a certain extent the fishering problem, but not entirely, because fishering has its own predecessors in what was known in the, in the literature of the 80s and the early 90s as restructuring. Um, Bennett Harrison's Lean and Mean is an important piece of work that prefigures the work uh, that David Weil has done on fishering. Um, there's a, another view of, of uh, income distribution and how it's accruing to the top 1%. Uh, but turning to the erosion of, of legal accountability, we have widespread misclassification, increased rates of violation. Uh, these have been documented to, to the limited extent that the, the literature allows us to directly measure noncompliance. I think it's quite suggestive that there has been an increase um, and that uh, fishing has contributed to it. Uh, all right, so uh, there are a number of potential responses on the income distribution front. Uh, some have been mentioned already. I do think that the, the proposal to increase the minimum wage in Ontario is an important one, um, but it doesn't address stagnation in the middle of the income distribution. Um, and for there, the, the solutions likely lie outside of employment standards. The possibilities of more effective labor laws, portable pensions and benefits, more progressive taxation, perhaps even regulation of executive compensation so as to leave more within the firm to be available for pre-distribution, as Sheila was discussing. With respect to legal accountability, uh, there are essentially two, um, there used to be a one and a two there on that slide. Uh, there, there are two different uh, ways of approaching this. One is to improve compliance and enforcement by detecting, deterring, and responding more effectively to violations in fishery industries. And the other would be to address the root causes of violations by altering incentive structures. 
So with respect to uh, improved compliance and enforcement, um, the first thing I'd say is uh, we need to understand why enterprises comply with uh, rules that cost them money. Uh, and, and in order to do this, in, in my report, I delved into a, a pretty wide literature. Um, and, and it led me to conclude that at, at, at the root of, of compliance in, in a population of regulated entities like employers, is, a, is a, an interaction between norms and economic and reputational incentives. Um, and the socio-legal literature, I think, shows us that norms can and do play an important role in certain circumstances. Um, it, it's uh, hard to account for the level of compliance that has been observed in many studies uh, purely on the basis of a calculation of the potential cost of sanctions multiplied by the risk of detection. Uh, that doesn't provide a full enough explanation. And so the socio-legal literature points to things like uh, social norms and the belief in a level playing field. And so what this suggests is that many employers will comply if they believe that there is a level playing field and their competitors are going to comply. Some will comply anyways out of commitments to, to norms. They tend to be employers whose practices are, are well ahead of the legislated minimums in any event. But a, a very significant part of the employer population will comply out of concern for uh, and, and response to a level playing field, which is partly normative and partly in their own interests. Um, but what that also suggests is that you can get to a tipping point where if, if enough employers don't believe that the playing field is level, compliance could drop off dramatically. Um, and the available data, as I say, it's, it's uh, spotty and somewhat scarce, but it does suggest that uh, while uh, many or most employers comply with most rules most of the time, a very significant minority are out of compliance in a persistent way. So, um, three compliance strategies that result from this. It's important to get good information out there into the hands of employers and employees. It's an argument both for um, uh, information campaigns from labor ministries to small employers in particular, but also the kinds of measures that uh, Raphael is, is uh, considering and arguing for. Um, it's also important, though, to, to reinforce the level playing field and the perception that it, that it can be counted upon. Um, and so here, uh, it's, it's clear that um, where there is deliberate noncompliance that violates the level playing field standard, um, it's important that ministries visibly and effectively deal with it by imposing deterrent sanctions and also by publicizing their actions so that the wider community can see that the, the level playing field norm has been reinforced. And finally, um, you know, the, the, the third set of general considerations that flows out of this analysis is that there are likely to be more than a few bad apples and that dealing with that end of uh, distribution of, of compliance behavior requires effective detection and deterrence. So among the recommendations in, in my study were expanding proactive inspection, uh, strategic targeting along the lines that David Weil has proposed in his important work. Um, the expansion of proactive inspection is really crucial. You cannot depend on a complaints-driven system to bring violations to the attention of the regulator. Um, it's also true that proactive inspection uh, tends to be effective at undercovering vi uncovering violations and uh, provides opportunities for a wholesale response to them rather than a retail case-by-case -case approach. All of this has to be supported by intelligence gathering, statistical uh, gathering statistics, engagement with stakeholders, um, building links between the labor ministry and other ministries that have valuable information on indicators of likely non-compliance. Uh, 
so that inspections can be targeted where they're likely to be most effective. I also argue in favor of the use of enforceable undertakings. If you can get proactive cooperation under the threat of the imposition of a sanction, perhaps, um, that you can use the leverage of the, the enforcement regime to begin to transform the internal practices of organizations. And the Fair Work Ombudsman in Australia has experimented notably with this kind of measure and seems to have had some success. But there are, there are a couple of structural challenges posed by fissuring. Um, you know, the, the fissuring creates the incentive structures which we've, we've seen discussed in this conference um, that push employers towards bad apple behavior. Uh, and that heightens the importance of strategies two and three. Um, but the very pervasiveness and persistence of these incentives raises two difficult problems, again, there used to be two numbers there. Uh, the the uh, first one is the cost of a sanctions regime that also provides due process. Um, if you're going to raise the amount of a sanction in order to give it greater de deterrent effect under the norms of due process in our legal system, you need to afford an opportunity to have the evidence, you know, the case proven. Uh, and an opportunity to, to challenge the imposition of the sanction with due process. Um, and that uh, can be expensive. So, you know, if you're providing wholesale enforcement, you face a trade-off between, you know, to, to what extent do you ratchet up the sanctions in every case, or to what extent do you reserve the heaviest sanctions for exemplary cases, um, which will be prosecuted uh, and, and result in a, in a visible public sanctioning process. These are important resource questions. Secondly, um, can compliance and enforcement strategies really get at root causes? Uh, and here I'm influenced both by the case studies discussed in David Weil's important work, but also by um, the research of Richard Locke, who has studied the, the important initiatives with respect to transnational codes of conduct. Um, and some of those codes of conduct involve brands that, that are highly sensitive to consumer pressure. They've, they've evolved to include things like uh, third-party monitoring, transparency, all the kinds of things that you would think would bring to bear important reputational incentives for brands. Uh, and yet, the truth is that many of those regimes uh, failed to deliver sustained improvements within the supply chains of brands like Nike and Reebok and so on, because they didn't get at the root causes. And Locke's studies also show that when you are able to get at root causes and change business practices, you tend to get better results. So um, there are ways that we can enhance compliance strategies to, to deal with these kinds of problems. Um, you know, the subway uh, agreement, for example, with a lead firm to uh, change voluntarily networked practices, practices rather, within the, the, fish, the fissured uh, business structure is one way to get at this. Uh, monitored self-regulation self agreements with leading employers are another. Um, we could also give the there, there have been proposals to follow the hot cargo model under the Fair Labor Standards Act of the United States and give the director uh, here in Ontario a similar power to embargo goods that are produced in contravention of the Employment Standards Act, and proposals to condition access to government procurement. Um, the logic of that is fairly straightforward. Why would you reward a company that persistently violates public policy uh, with a contract to, pl to supply services to the government or other public agencies. But each of those strategies has its own limitations, right? Um, the propensity for a lead firm to engage in a voluntary arrangement of one of those sorts uh, depends much on the sensitivity of its brand to consumer pressure. Uh, it may also depend on whether it's a closely held corporation uh, or subject to the incentives of short-term investors. Um, 
The, obviously, the hot cargo provisions deal with the production of goods. It's much more difficult to imagine the embargoing of services. Uh, and, of course, uh, conditioning access to government procurement depends, you know, for its effectiveness on the, the interest of the supplier in, in getting a government contract. Um, so, you know, we need to think beyond compliance strategies. Clearly, enhanced workplace representation rules are one way in which you might expect stronger enforcement. You know, the research is pretty consistent that uh, compliance tends to be higher in unionized workplaces. Uh, and so part of, the, of any employment strategy, any employment standard strategy, rather, should be uh, thinking about um, uh, representation and access to meaningful representation. Um, another dimension of the problem, though, is to think about uh, changes to rules of legal responsibility. Um, and here, I think what we need to focus on is, you know, how can, can we rethink the, the control and dependency nexus that defines the employment relationship across a whole range of labor and employment laws? And in particular, the types of control or influence that lead to legal responsibility. Um, now here, I'd point to a, an interesting paper by uh, Kelly Mildred that was recently published in the Canadian Labor and Employment Law Journal. S she suggests that we, we look at a couple of different examples of legal responsibility to expand our imagination about the possibilities. Uh, one is the cause or permit standard that's used under environmental law. Uh, so there the idea is that if um, an, a, a, an actor has uh, control or opportunity to prevent a, a risk or, or harm um, that it may be held liable. And control includes the ability to supervise or inspect, improve uh, business methods, um, or uh, exhort those who have uh, direct control uh, in such a way as to influence them. Now, it's subject to a due diligence defense. Um, but it, I think, provides at least food for thought. We also have the construction lien model in Ontario, which recognizes that um, responsibility for wage payment is shared among a, uh, within a, a chain of subcontracting arrangements. Okay. Um, now, uh, before leaving the subject of of um, altering incentive structures by changing rules of legal responsibility, I should mention that we also need to think about to what extent these, these new tests, legal tests, can be made workable. Uh, if the whole inquiry is dependent very much on the facts of every particular business arrangement, you know, much in the way that the common control and direction test for related employers is highly fact dependent, it's going to depend on litigation and relitigation and create incentives to gerrymander the, the business relationship to avoid the latest precedent. And one of the things that um, Michael Mitchell and John Murray were very sensitive to in their deliberations was the need to come up with, a, in essence, a bright line test or presumptions that certain categories of business relationship fall within the, the regime of legal responsibility, precisely to avoid that kind of endless relitigation of particular fact situations. How will politics respond? Um, I'll cut to the chase because I'm running out of time. I think there are very important measures contained in, in uh, Bill 148. Uh, I, I would not diminish the importance of the minimum wage increase. Um, but there are lots of things missing. Uh, there's no announcement of a concrete plan for strategic enforcement to deal with fishering. Uh, there's no plan for um, a process to impose major deterrent sanctions, as Murray and Mitchell proposed, that the Ontario Labor Relations Board be empowered to hear cases and impose significant sanctions, exemplary uh, um, forms of deterrence. Uh, there's no, no discussion of changes to legal responsibility in network production, um, and even within labor relations outside of uh, sorry, uh, I'll get to that in a moment, but uh, outside of successorship and building services, there's, there's no changes um, enabling new models of representation. Uh, 
So some of this, though, reflects the fact that even within the Changing Workplaces re Review, these big ideas didn't get, uh, didn't result in recommendations. Um, there's very little rethinking of legal responsibility within network production presented in that report outside of the franchising uh, scenario. Um, so why is that? Uh, and what, will, what are the prospects that um, we can get our political system <laughs> to respond to all of this? Part of the problem, I think, is that the expert literature doesn't yet have a clear vision of where to go with all of this. The concept of legal responsibility needs to be thought through more fully. Um, the justifications for assigning responsibility outside of the traditional contract of employment need to be discussed, need to become part of our policy discourse so that uh, they, they begin to appear as a form of common sense as a response to uh, an existing and recognized problem. Um, new models of representation face a similar challenge. How do you scale up representation within fissured networks enough to make it effective without changing the very rules around union representation that the Wagner model is built on? Can, is it workable to, to require majoritarian exclusivity and the all or nothing approach in every instance? Probably not. But then you're left with the question, well, how will alternative models of representation interact with the existing Wagner model? Will it, in fact, if you loosen up or change the way in which representation rights can be acquired, will that undercut the um, existing Wagner model? Lastly, if you'll permit me one minute, um, I identify the uncertain prospects of pro progressive politics. I expect this is something that Harry may have something to say about in his presentation. In a, in, and since this book is on offer here, I thought I might um, summarize my thoughts on this issue uh, by drawing on a paper that I wrote um, in Harry's honor in the paper. So here, I say we need to take Harry's recent and by his own admission somewhat lugubrious assessment very seriously. As he points out, the working class, if it was ever constituted and conscious as such, is no longer. Manufacturing, the geographic center of union organizing and worker solidarity, is now globally dispersed into supply chains. Working people are increasingly dispersed in other ways too, both legally uh, and culturally through identity politics, consumerism, and so on. To this, I would add that our uh, dispersal is also intellectual. In the, in the contemporary media environment, we are scarcely able to sort and absorb the flood of constantly available information and distractions. Who would have thought, other than the Russians perhaps, that the internet could make us so confused? Um, faced with incessant and, in, and effective bids for our attention, we do not linger on complex problems. We move on as a matter of cultural practice. As Thomas de Zangotita observes, depth is to our lives, what dead air is to a talk show. How then are complex solutions to complex social problems to find time and place for democratic deliberation and collective mobilization? Those who care about the future of workplace law thus find themselves seeking a new legal landscape while carrying a burden of doubt. But here, we continue to find Harry, steadfast, patient, and vigorous despite his misgivings directing attention to defiant publics, arising in response to the most recent financial crisis, to advances in economic theory and empirical research, revealing capitalism's instabilities and flaws, to encouraging the creativity to propose plausible improvements, and to the importance of freedom of association, expression, and assembly to creating a safe space within which critics and protesters can do their work. And we are grateful for his insight, his perseverance, and his company. Thank you. Of course. <laughs>
So like all the other speakers, I would like to express my thanks for being invited to participate in this wonderful conference. Thank you, Western, and thank you, Faskins, and thank you, Koski Minsky. And I'd like to give a special thanks to Michael, uh, who said to me, if you need another 15 or 20 minutes beyond the scheduled time, please feel free to take it. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to begin, as no speaker ought to do, with, with three disclaimers. Uh, the first is that, as you know, there's a federal review of labor standards going on. Uh, I've been asked to uh, assist in that review. I want to assure you, and I want you to keep in mind, that nothing I say today ought to be ascribed to the federal government. Uh, I haven't begun my work with them. I don't know what they're doing. and. I am not speaking on their behalf. Uh, second disclaimer, uh, I don't have any PowerPoint. Uh, but the last five speakers have each presented wonderful PowerPoints. So at the appropriate moments, I'm going to click like this, and your imagination will conjure up those previous PowerPoints that have since mm -hmm. disappeared from the screen. Now, my third disclaimer. I think David Weil has written a remarkable book, a wonderful book. But I do have one reservation. I don't think the title of the book is as good as it could have been. The Fissured Workplace borrows from, from geology, as David told us last night, uh, the idea of fissuring. Fissuring is a natural process that occurs in geological time. What we're witnessing is not a natural process, and it's occurring very, very quickly. What's happening to our workplaces is a result of strategies adopted deliberately by human agents, enabled by technology, legitimated by law, and embedded in the deep structures of our political economy. Workplaces, in other words, have been fracked and not fissured. And the result is that workplaces today can be described by yet another word, which begins with F and ends with ED and has a bunch of asterisks in between. <laughs> now, fissuring or fracking, this is the key point, has effectively disempowered unions whose internal solidarity, collective bargaining rights, and capacity for concerted action all depend on the model of the workplace that fissuring has done much to destroy. Yes, of course, we have to acknowledge the role of globalization, of technology, of no neoliberalism, of the financialization of capital, all of those things we have to acknowledge. But whether we applaud them or deplore them, we have to accept that there is no going back to the good old days in which that model persisted when it was tacitly assumed that employment would be a long-term relationship, when workers' public rights and private entitlements would be largely determined by their status as employees <coughs> in, in some particular enterprise. I say my next sentence with tears in my eyes. I wish it were otherwise, but I cannot imagine how North American trade unions are going to revive collective bargaining as we knew it from, say, 1945 to 1970. Card checks are not going to do it. Minority unionism is not going to do it. Anti-scab legislation is not going to do it. Nothing is going to do it until workers once again stand together in solidarity, once again demand justice, once again assert themselves through political and industrial action. Well, what happens in the meantime? In the meantime, workers will depend more and more 
on statutory labor standards to fill the vacuum left by the demise of collective bargaining. This raises two quite different sets of questions. One, why do I think there's a better chance of enhancing labor standards than there is of reviving collective bargaining? And two, how might labor standards change to meet the new and difficult tasks I've assigned to them? So, why do I think there's a better chance of enhancing labor standards? Obviously, all attempts to regulate labor markets and the employment relation have to contend with the inhospitable political economy described so well by people who've been up here this morning. However, statutory standards, I contend, have a somewhat better chance of being adopted. They are potentially universal in their application, not dependent on the employment nexus and not designed to produce employer-specific outcomes like the Wagner model of collective bargaining. They are minimal, not optimal, in their ambition, and therefore perhaps somewhat less likely to engender either extreme employer intransigence or the envy and opposition of unorganized workers. They are created and enforced by the state and do not depend on labor's dwindling ability to create and enforce working conditions in individual workplaces. They can be expressed and understood in the language of fairness or decency or equity, and therefore have a greater chance of eliciting the political support of equality-seeking groups and anti-poverty activists. They can and sometimes do enjoy the support of responsible employers who are trying to level the playing field by suppressing low-wage competition. Of course, statutory labor standards will still be opposed by free market ideologues, by irate small business owners, and by employers who cannot circumvent them by plugging into supply chains in other non-regulated jurisdictions. <clears throat> of course, statutory standards are only meaningful to the extent that they are vigorously promoted and enforced by labor departments which, alas, are not always aggressive in discharging their responsibilities. And of course, any given statutory standards can be criticized on the grounds that they're too low or that they effectively ignore the needs of significant elements of the workforce, or that they have become anachronistic in, new, in, in light of new workplace practices. Nonetheless, as union density is being driven inexorably downward, statutory standards look pretty good by comparison. How might statutory standards evolve in the short term and, oh, try to say in the long term as well? In the short term, we pretty well know what has to be done. Here's a possible shopping list. We might try to redefine coverage so that it extends to cohorts of workers who have been fracked and now aren't covered by employment standards. We might think about reducing or eliminating incentives for employers to make jobs more, more precarious, and let me say incentives as well for workers to shun employment status in the vain hope that they will become profitable small businesses. This might involve tighter regulation of employment agencies, changing the tax laws, and other measures which aren't, strictly speaking, employment standards. We might want to rethink the present focus of labor ministries, which often spend too much of their resources on processing individual complaints by former employees who have, who have been deprived of some monetary benefit. Instead, labor ministries might want to proactively monitor employees to ensure compliance and ensure compliance, let me say, not just with labor standards legislation, but with the entire suite of work-related statutes 
from payroll taxes to pension contributions to health and safety laws and the Human Rights Code. In the same vein, we might look at requiring delinquent employers not only to pay their victims unpaid wages or severance or vacation pay, but also to compensate them fully for all losses flowing from the violation, including, for example, legal costs and travel costs. And in addition to or in lieu of the current seldom invoked system of criminal sanctions, employers found in violation might be made subject to control orders designed to ensure their future compliance. Such orders might require delinquent companies to file periodic workplace audits at their own expense, to post corporate bonds, or they might impose specific obligations on corporate managers and directors. In the longer term, however, we might want to revisit the key assumption of employment standards, that they will function by reading minimally acceptable terms into individual employment contracts. That's the central concept of employment standards. Instead, we might remind ourselves that the whole point of these standards, of the whole point of ensuring fairness in one-on-one -on -one employment relations, is to achieve broadly decent social outcomes, greater equity, enhanced security of income and purchasing power, optimal deployment of the labor force, ensuring a better life for workers and their families. At present, we try to achieve these outcomes by enacting and enforcing standards. Perhaps quite a different approach would work better. Some examples. As job tenure becomes shorter and shorter, rarer and rarer, it will become more and more difficult and less and less cost-effective to provide employer-specific job training or to maintain benefit systems such as drug plans or pensions based on long-term employment in a given enterprise. Perhaps, indeed, uh, we should require all employers and workers to contribute to what I call a benefit bank that would fund job training or benefit coverage either through a sta state scheme, through contracts with private providers, or through grants to individual workers. Uh, in Australia, I read the other night, uh, employers and workers are mandated to contribute to what's called uh, a loading for casual workers, which creates essentially a fund to a system in making employment transitions, uh, supports their retirement, helps them acquire uh, the training, the skills that they need. It's a scheme that I think uh, warrants careful examination by us. Artificial intelligence and other technologies are sure to cost us large numbers, to cost uh, workers large numbers of jobs. Rather than attempt to deal with this dislocation through redundancy pay or unemployment insurance, perhaps workers or a state fund acting as their proxy should be awarded shares in the reconfigured enterprise. As collective bargaining becomes increasingly rare, here I follow up a point that Rafael Gomez made, as collective bargaining becomes increasingly rare, some alternative voice mechanism needs to be developed, not only for the sake of workers, but for the sake of employers, and to safeguard our democratic polity. Perhaps every workplace ought to have a workplace rights advocacy committee selected by workers. Initially, these bodies would have a limited function, but that function is implicit in the title. That function would be to advocate for workers in relation to all of their statutory rights that affect their employment, including human rights and health and safety and employment standards, and on and on. Uh, 
at the moment, individual workers are asked to carry the burden of advocacy on their own behalf, and that they simply cannot do. So a statutorily created and appropriately protected workplace committee with advocacy functions would be the immediate goal. The long-term goal of such a strategy would be uh, to keep alive a kind of folk memory of collective action so that even though the institutional form of that folk memory, which we know now, the trade union, disappears into the mists of time, there would be some institution left upon which we can build again an effective voice for workers. Professor Wilde's big insight about the fissured workplace has pointed up the need for us to think big about labor standards. Of course we have to put band-aids on the present system and of course we have to acknowledge that even retaining labor standards in their present form is going to present a significant political challenge in some jurisdictions, including those often described in two letters, one of which is U. Of course we know that. And of course we know that it's going to take many years for big ideas to change the direction of mainstream discourse, let alone to become the law of the land. But if we don't think big, if we don't think creatively, we will never catch up with the changing forms of employment and labor market structures. We have been trying to catch up since the first labor standards legislation was adopted in the United Kingdom in 1802. I think it's time we got a little ahead of the game. Thank you. Well, we have, I think, uh, five minutes uh, for questions. There are a number of fascinating ideas been discussed. I mean, we've heard mention just this morning from contract compliance and the difficulty with it that, you know, depends on your desire to contract with the, with the uh, regulating agency. Uh, and here we have a, a stream of ideas. Uh, we're working with the tools we have. Uh, we can take incremental steps and so on, but uh, we really are looking at uh, perhaps it's lugubrious in a way, uh, but it's, it's paradigm change really is what we're looking at with the statistics, with the measurements that we've looked at today. I mean, there's fundamental movement in, in all the tools and institutions that we are trained in and know and so on. And everyone in this room, of course, is privileged to be able to contribute to some better contribution to society to improving exactly as, as Harry's last talk just mentioned, fairness and equity and so on. I mean, uh, when we think of uh, Brian's introductory remarks this morning uh, about international codes and human rights uh, around the world and the, uh, the, uh, the treaties and covenants and so on, I mean, you can't reduce it as people try to three words, every person matters, but I think that's the concern we're hearing about here, that's what's driving us and everyone in this room, and particularly these three fine speakers, have shown how when you're engaged in this, in this subject and this search, uh, what we can consider and how we can make progress. So if you have questions, please, I don't mean to preempt them. <laughs> 
Are there other questions? This is a, a, essentially a sort of a, a concept of funding, uh, a central funding mechanism. And, yes, and ensuring the level of Yeah. Other questions? So the question is, is there an incompatibility between uh, government procurement requirements imposed uh, and free trade uh, rules generally, as I, as I hear it? Um, anyone on the panel like to um, comment on these questions? Go ahead. Um, well, it's, it's not something that I've studied. I don't doubt that it could be a problem, though. Um, and it, it, that adds a layer of complexity if, in fact, you have to look at what's going on in other jurisdictions to establish the compliance floor. Um, it's, that adds complexity both for the officials administering the program and, and for employers who want to bid on contracts, right? It's already hard enough to understand the, the uh, provincial legislation that applies directly to you without having to understand what's going on in, in other jurisdictions as well. Um, I, I think there's probably a useful supporting role for some sort of compliance program, um, but I think the thrust of my analysis was that we shouldn't put all of our eggs in that basket for sure. There are much more promising tools than that. Just, just a word about the idea of a, of a special le levy to fund enforcement or compliance strategies. Uh, I, I, I think you open up a very large question which needs to be discussed, which is uh, people are very tax averse. Uh, add a nickel to any transaction and you will be accused of being a job killer. Uh, you will not escape censure because the idea arose in a group of reputable corporations that, that you and your firm represent. Um, averse, uh, 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 this, this, this reluctance to pay taxes uh, opens up a whole huge issue of how you can sustain decent working conditions in light of, of, of the decline of the welfare state, which uh, seems to be proceeding apace in many, many countries. Uh, welfare state costs money. Who would deny it? It may create very positive outcomes, but it costs money. Uh, minimum wages cost money. Uh, people are persuaded, and this is a big achievement, I think, of neoliberalism since 1980, is to persuade ordinary working people that it is in their interest to reduce their own tax burden. Uh, most employers need no persuasion. They're already convinced of that point. And this point of convergence, opposition to paying taxes, has the not very subtle consequence of being reluctant to, to support government activity, whether it's uh, aggressive enforcement of minimum wage standards, uh, 
provision of social supports for people who have been uh, who have lost their jobs, uh, even taking some of the stress off collective bargaining, as for example the supply of health care, by shifting it into a general social program. That, that the, our ability to do that is to some extent inhibited by people's unwillingness to pay their share of, of what such programs cost. So I, I, I can certainly understand and give them the limited agenda of the meeting that you describe, how some modest uh, levy on on on, uh, on employers, whether it's delinquent employers or all employers, how that might uh, might be viewed favorably if it's small enough not to not to really burden the business with with additional tax costs. But I, I suspect an awful lot of workers, if asked, would you favor uh, increased payroll deductions uh, in order to fund better enforcement of labor standards, confronted with such a question, I'm afraid many workers would say, no, I'm not prepared to do that. <coughs> I just I would I would have I would echo what what Harry was saying but I would also add and I'm not a student of experience rating mm -hmm. except for maybe looking at employment insurance over the years and uh, others know a lot about experience rating in the WSIB system but I would also sort of add that there need to be a, a lot of caution taken in terms of adopting that kind of experience rated um, that experience rated model but otherwise I, w I would concur and I would also just in, in terms of your comment, Andrew, about procurement, I think there's been a lot of experimentation around this, especially in the United States, and certainly at the city level, it's had some positive effects in terms of contributing to larger living wage type situations, but it, it has like, the significant limits that, that, that you uh, identify. To the extent that we've left a lot of unanswered questions for you, uh, that's what teachers do. Uh, please join me at very much, we're just running out of time and I apologize for that, but please join me in expressing our appreciation for these three speakers today. Thank you.